the concerns that this proposal is meant to address mainly have to do with kind of other things that people have been complaining about for months, uh, the biggest one being like fee markets and relayer markets. Um, so I will kind of explain the problem first. So the problem is like status quo is basically you have a bunch of shards and each of these shards have blocks, um, but the shards only hear about each other at a kind of very delayed schedule and like this is because like at, at somewhere in the middle here you have a cross link uh, into, into the beacon chain and this takes about, uh, about one epoch. And so basically, it, like, at base, uh, in the status quo proposal, at base layer for one shard to learn like, state roots of other shards, it takes like, about six minutes. Um, and the, uh, this is obviously bad for if you want to be able to have any kind of cross-shard dApps. And the proposal that we've been suggesting to get around this basically has to do with these kind of optimistic states. So basically, you have this kind of optimistic mechanism that says, oh, well, if you're over here, then like, you can make a kind of conditional block that says, uh, and this conditional block just like, says, oh, I think, the state, I think the state root of this shard actually is this value, um, and if it is this, then, then the output is going to be this. Um, and you just have these blocks kind of exist as a thing on layer two, and then there would be these different kind of protocols for achieving this. And at some point later, uh, there would be some later process over here that, that kind of sorts through all these blocks, figures out which ones are kind of correct, which ones are not correct, and kind of threads everything together. Right? So kind of step one, blocks over here or kind of packages over here kind of publish ahead of time opinions about what happens in other shards. And these opinions are not necessarily 100% correct, but things happen based off of those opinions and so things have dependencies. And clients, can like basically figure out ahead of time like how these blocks will get will get uh, kind of glued together, but then there is a process that kind of glues these blocks to, uh, together on chain kind of in the future. And execution environments are supposed to kind of be involved in implementing this. The reason why this is un uh, this this is not very nice is basically because. If you want to look at this from a point of view of like, I am a transaction center, and hi, I'm Alice, um, and I want to send some coins to Bob. Um, and I, Alice, I have coins on this chart. But it turns, but what, what I want to do is I want to send some coins over to Bob. And you have um, Bob over here. And uh, Alice wants to send some, send some coins to Bob. And then Bob wants to be able to do things with those coins immediately, like sending them to Charlie or putting them into Uniswap, uh, which will would automatically send some die to Charlie. But if Alice has coins and Alice sends coins to Bob, then the coins, like the underlying base protocol level ether, would not get over here immediately. And so Bob does not yet have protocol level ether. Bob has kind of voodoo optimistic ether, which will become protocol level ether. But because like it's voodoo ether is a layer two thing, like we can't trust block proposers to understand what voodoo ether is because block proposers are not expected to speak all of these execution environment languages. And so block proposer, like basically Bob has nothing with which to pay block proposers until like maybe at some point later in the future his ether becomes real, which will happen over here. And so Bob like theoretically has coins but cannot pay transaction fees. So, this has historically been kind of solved with this kind of magic catch for three relayer markets, but we've been kind of thinking about relayer markets recently and like realizing more and more that like first of all, this kind of design, like it seems to minimize layer one complexity, but it has like a lot of layer two complexity around all these optimistic games and relayer markets get monopolized easily. There's like censorship issues and a bunch of other nasty stuff. So that's the problem. Um, so here is the solution. The solution basically says we have the we have a bunch of different shards, and we're, what we're going to do is basically have a crosslink in every slot. So these shards are going to get crosslinked into the beacon block, um, and then the shard blocks of the next slot are going to be aware of the beacon, of the of the output of the beacon block. They're going to do things, and then they're going to be included over here, and then you have another beacon block. Um, 
then over here you would have more shard blocks, and so you have kind of a much tighter coupling between the shards where each shard, like any block on any one shard is aware of everything that happened on uh, previous shards. So the reason why this is nice now is because like on top of this we can also add functionality for kind of moving either between shards within a single slot. And so if um, Alice has, um, has some coins over here, then Alice over here can just make a receipt um, that, that says, hey, I want to give um, uh, points, to, uh, points to Bob. Um, and the, like, you can even have functionality where kind of the underlying execution environments could even like, transfer you from one shard to the other. And then Bob, who's, um, who's going to be um, over here, um, Bob will like, basically get the, be able to include the receipt, and Bob actually has it. And because Bob actually has ETH, then over here Bob can immediately use ETH to do things like paying transaction fees. So I guess like when we look at like what really are what, what really are, are sorry what execution environments are for, um, like execution environments kind of serve different roles in ETH two. Um, so one of them is they describe account semantics. Um, so. Basically, like, is this like balances, uh, UTXOs, um, receipts, um, and they also uh, describe like, uh, um, and they also kind of create a storage system, um, and they also have to handle like basically um, um, cross shard well. Or they also had to support things like optimistic state, um, and like they would have to support, and, and they would have to come up with some like special purpose like fee payment strategies. So making a kind of full execution environment like have all these components, right? And this proposal basically says you don't need to do this anymore, and you don't need to do this anymore because the protocol is kind of tightly connected enough to just be able to do this stuff natively. Good. So to kind of poke a bit more deeply, um, one ex like basically the way that fee payment could happen is you have um, Alice over here, and Alice is just going to send a transaction. And the transaction would have WASM execution, and the was of execution would be would have a, one of the outputs that it could give is it could give an opcode that basically is like fee payment, right? And fee payment is basically an opcode that says take ether out of the current execution environment and pay ether to the current proposer. So if we have a special opcode, this is basically the pay gas proposal, right? You have like this kind of top level was of opcode that just said or was of FFI that just says take ether out of the execution environment and kind of give it as a fee. And Ba, uh, whoever is the block proposer, does not need to understand execution environments because Bob can just run code and see if Bob gets paid the fee, and Bob knows that Bob, that Bob will get paid the fee. Um, so, sorry, not Bob, the proposer knows that the, propos that the proposer will get paid the fee. Um, now, there's Kind of, like there's stuff that you can do that you can do on top. So like for example, if you want to kind of allow transactions to be merged to share Merkle proofs and all of that nice stuff, you can do this. Um, but like that's more detail. So question like the big question here is like what sacrifices are we um, do we have to make to get this right? So if we do this without changing parameters, then basically the overhead is, of the beacon chain is going to increase by a factor of 64. And increasing the beacon chain, well, more specifically, the attestation processing overhead is going to increase by a factor of 64. <coughs> now, that's kind of, and the other problem that we would have is that the number of active uh, validators um, that we would need per slot um, in order to actually be able to process everything in every shard like goes up, right? So. Basically, over here, if you have n shards, then like you would want to have 1,028 or 128 times <coughs> n, um, and then if you want, like you basically, if we're still like if we still have an epoch length of 64, 
then we would actually need 128 times n times 64, and it's 1,024. And so like, we would need there to be like, basically more ether than actually just validating to be able to process everything in a single slot. Or else we have to cut down the epoch length. And if we cut down the epoch length, then we kind of compress things even more and really blow up the chain. So the second part of this proposal is that we kind of do some, do some parameter tweaking. Um, and the parameter tweaking that I'm suggesting is um, shard count um, goes from 1,024 down to 64. Um, shard block size um, goes down from goes up from 16 target 64 max to um, 128 target um, 5, uh, 512 max. Um, and so this all together, this is obviously divided by 16 times 8, and so we obviously get times one half times one half shard throughput or total system throughput. But I mean, I'm arguing that this is fine, and the reason um, actually we also we're also doubling the block. Uh, well, instead of having small slot times, we would have larger block times, so there would be another divided by two. So we would be kind of one quarter, basically cutting down the throughput, but to about a quarter of what it was. <coughs> and my argument is that this is fine because like, realistically there's not gonna be a thousand X increase in the number of users anyway. And we can just kind of start these numbers low and kind of conservatively ratchet them up over time. Um, so what this, you know, there's kind of other optimiza um, optimizations um, that we can, okay, so I guess, so first of all, just to clarify, like in this architecture, even though you have a crosslink every slot, um, from the point of view of FFG, you would still have epochs. And FFG epochs would still have a length of 64 slots. I mean, if we want, we can make it 32, but... Yeah, what's yeah. the trade-off when you reduce that? Okay, so the trade-off we've reduced, so this is kind of overhead analysis. So from a you know, overhead point of view, right, um, there's basically kind of two major, there's a couple of major components to overhead. One is um, EC pairings. Um, the other is uh, EC uh, additions um, and kind of pub key reads. Um, and a third is like end of epoch kind of balance updating, right? Uh, so I can, in basically, um, EC pairings are kind of, they're actually, EC pairings are proportional to the number of crosslinks that you have, but not to the number of total validators. Um, and so, EC, basically, EC pairings are the thing that this proposal are, might end up going up by a factor of four, but I have an idea for instead of making it go up by a factor of four, like maybe only make it go up by a factor of two. Um, the idea here is basically that like delayed attestations just kind of get merged. You all get merged because you have to do, uh, publish something else for a delayed attestation. Um, and then EC adds. This is proportional to the number of valid. This is like basically validators divided by epoch length, and this is also like validators divided by epoch length. So if the epoch length goes down, then like more blocks will be of these end of epoch blocks that take a really large amount of time to process. Um, and you know, we, we, be, like, we basically kind of have a, and have some, uh, have a kind of trade-off to make here. Um, Danny, would you agree that like, at the status right now, end of epoch blocks are kind of closer to being, like take considerably longer to process than like 128 max application blocks? No, I think it's actually the other way. Well, uh, I think that even at even then, most of the load still comes from the attestations. Um, mm -hmm. At least in the lighthouse benchmarks that I've seen, mm -hmm. the epoch portion of that, even at like four million validators, is is a fraction of the actual block time. So that's actually not as big of a concern. Okay. I mean, if this is true, we can also cut the epoch length down from 64 to 32, and that's kind of actually it's good for other reasons yeah. because. Like it cuts, it cuts in half the amount of ETH that we would need for um, this to, be, uh, to actually be able to process like all shards in a single slot. Another parameter is the ETH per validator. Correct. Um, correct. And I think, in general, I don't like. I would not support reducing ETH per validator. I mean, 
like if I was come, coming up with an ether validator number from scratch, I would say 64 instead of 32. But like, mm, I mean, th I, I feel like the mean value of 32 is worth more than the mean value of 1024. And like, if we have to, and and the value and the mean value of like gains to composability is also pretty high. So like, sacrificing this to kind of maintain one and increase the other seems good. Yeah. That's, yes. So to what extent can I rely? On a crosslink, because shards um, can fork, right? So yes. a cr presence of a crosslink doesn't indicate that anything is final at this stage. Okay, good question. Um, so one thing that this proposal does is, kind of like, in this one, like, by, one thing you might notice here is that shard chains don't exist, right? Now, in the proposal I have, shard chains do kind of exist in this sort of limited ephemeral form, um, and they can show a kind of why there's value. But okay, so basically in this model. The, like, if I publish a transaction, kind of here's the kind of increasing levels of confirmation I experience, right? So step one, I publish a transaction. So Alice publishes a transaction, it's floating in the air. Right now, Bob um, knows that unless Alice double spends her, Bob is going to get paid, right? Like this is like it's a, this is the same as like Bitcoin, you know, like zero con for whatever. Um, step two, this transaction gets included into a block into a, a shard block proposal. Now there is a bit more confirmation. Step three, um, then you have crosslink votes and crosslink votes start accumulating on the shard block proposal, and then you get a bit more confirmation. Step four, um, the um, a yeah, shard block gets proposed, and this shard block actually like two thirds of the votes in the shard block for this particular, or two thirds of the votes over here um, actually are for this block, in which case now the basically the beacon chain kind of stands behind this block. So that's option one. Option two is maybe less than two thirds of the committee votes like support this block. And then there's two options. Option two A is that two thirds of the votes support something else. And if two thirds of the vote supports something else, then this guy then this guy's gone, and this transaction should just wait until it gets included somewhere else. Option two B is that maybe there's two blocks, and maybe none of them got two thirds, right? So maybe like one, this one got forty percent, this one got forty percent, and the other twenty percent are just offline. If this happens, and th these could be like two can be conflicting blocks, so the proposer gets slashed, or this. One of them could be like the zero block, right? So if the product composer published a little bit late, then like you might have a 50-50. If this happens, then what we have, um, or the third possibility is that there actually are 70%, but the beacon block proposer is like being a little evil and deciding not to include things. So if this happens, um, then actually I'll just draw it out. Let's say you have another beacon block, and include, 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 but this is not getting included. Right. Then what happens is that a proposal over here, like basically it would be pointing to this, and it would also have another pointer to this. Right. So um, this is like sh um, shard zero um, slot uh, one two three. Um, this would be shard zero slot four. A slot four proposal, like basically a slot four proposal, if it's pointing to a beacon chain. Which where in the previous um, the previous included slot is less than three, it has the proposal has to contain an opinion about what happened in slot three, and then shard who like let's suppose like without loss of generality that this guy's legitimate, um, then he is going to include um, one two of these things and he's going to include a cross link. And that cross link is going to contain an opinion about this, and it's going to contain an opinion about this, and, and so this gets included. So there is a kind of delayed inclusion functionality. Um, the now the so the only thing that you lose here is basically in that over here cross shard like cross shard communication gets delayed by one slot because this is like this is not aware of this, but otherwise like you have delayed inclusion. You have delayed inclusion at a time, and then the final level of confirmation is when like this guy gets finalized, and then Alice's uh, transaction to Bob is finalized. So the only forking that's happening with respect to a shard chain in the general case is if the actual beacon chain works, because each shard block is containing a previous reference to the beacon chain. So only 
only if you reordered the beacon chain would you actually, could you see reorgs in the short chain. Okay, okay. Um, and then in this, this ephemeral case where you kind of have an emergent shard chain, you do have less confirmation, but it hasn't yet communicated with any other shards. So you, you, you don't have the issue of like shards being dependent on each other. Right. Yes. Um, if we assume that one of the shards is completely reversible mm -hmm. and puts in transactions that actually validate the state transition. Uh, but since everybody's adversarial, they would put it in anyway. Will it be accepted by the beacon chain, or do they actually do some sort of validation on the stage? Well, it depends what we mean by like who's they, right? Because so I'll, I'll list who the actors are. One actor is shard proposers, um, another actor is committees. So pro if the proposer is malicious and pr and proposes a bad block, then generally the committee will not accept it. Another possibility is the proposer is malicious, the committee is also malicious. The committee points to a malicious thing. Uh, and, and, the, um, and then this beacon block kind of theoretically points to invalid shard chain data. If, yeah, so, right, okay, so if this happens, right, then first of all, like this is already violating like the uh, security assumptions. Um, so there's like to recover from this kind of situation, like you would basically need to, um, so I wrote a separate proposal about this actually. Like, what, uh, but so the set, basically, there's two kind of possibilities. One of them is that if you have this block, then eventually it'll be discovered through fraud proofs, and when it gets discovered through fraud proofs, then like everything gets reverted. Um, and you can't really revert less than everything, like if you will, because the re, like in practice, the dependency graphs, especially between 64 shards, are going to be super tight. The second proposal that is basically that you have this kind of roll-up like scheme where you don't, like if it's unavailable, then you revert, but if it's invalid, then you don't revert, the, like you revert the in shard state, but you do not revert the chain, and you kind of revert the shard state within the, chain, well, within the chain. Um, and the idea for this, behind this, is that this allows kind of fraud proof assumptions to be a kind of more subjective and more of a client side choice instead of like forcing a secret assumption on everyone. But like these things will only happen in the extreme case where a committee gets uh, broken by an attacker, which in general requires more than one sort of malicious. Yes? So if there's a fork on a short chain, now these two forks are basically also including two forks on the chain, and what will happen? It's not possible for two conflicting shard chain blocks to be included on the same beacon chain. But they are separately confirmed by different beacon chains. Oh, by, by different, okay. So what we're seeing is that there's two beacon chains, um, and then there's like the shard chain, which gets included over here, and then over here, let's say, this one gets included here, and then this is a zero block, and it gets included here, right? Is that what you're saying? I mean, there's two basic two sharp, sharp, sharp block, a block of sharp chains. Yeah. Okay. So basically, each, each like one of them is confirmed by different. Okay. So in this diagram, right, like the, the zeros with a hole between them are beacon chain blocks, um, and the 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 full ones are shard chain blocks, right? Like, is this what you're basically saying, or are you saying? So what what are the hash pointers? Oh, like these are the hash pointers. Like. Yeah. So that fork at the end. You, the, the dot at the top is one shard block, the dot at the bottom is a different shard yeah. block, and they've entered into a fork yeah. of beacon chains. Yes. Yeah, this is fine. I mean, conflicting beacon chains can point to conflicting shard chains. It's a matter of... So eventually, who has the most majority of like, uh, votes? Um, who, uh, whoever the be uh, whichever beacon chain wins decides. Yeah, so when you're, when you're attested to the shard blocks, you're also attested to the head of the beacon chain, so you're giving the weight to the, the fork choice for the beacon chain. So that would still resolve itself by the fork choice by justifying blocks and ultimately by applying files. So actually, uh, I, will, I will probably pass some comments because there are some similar consensus which we use in company of first mm -hmm. when you change first you know, consensus that is uh, determining uh, the fork choice rule of different strong chain actually already existed. So I mean, also the, the portal is also running really well. And it doesn't need to, to be, uh, for example, the strong chain or root of the chain can run on some old pill has maybe other pill that were consensus. Uh, I mean, in this, in this uh, context. Yeah. What's the question? So, so I mean, in, in this context, does it, does, does it require the uh, some of the chain run 
some POS concerns. So Theoretically, the VPJ could run proof of work if you really wanted to. Yes. So I want to ask a question about the previous proposal. Okay. The, um, yes. You, know, you shared before the interop, yes. uh, around time, the interop block. Yes. And it was called like alternative phase two. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, with removing persistent state routes from right. shards mm -hmm. and Executing yes. code on mm -hmm. uh, code on in beacon mm -hmm. blocks. Um, mm -hmm. I think we some of us liked that proposal because uh -huh. we felt it offered mm -hmm. uh, sharp transparency, right? In essence, and so, um, yeah. and what then in this uh, radical new new proposal uh, is it? We're returning back to persistent shards, or is there a way to combine the two? So that I actually think the two are in a kind of similar philosophical direction, and, and the reasons I would give for that are like one is that because you have like shard chain, like the shards are kind of tightly connected to each other. Like theoretically, you could have designs where kind of things happen on one shard and then they just get moved over to another shard. Like the kind of synchrony here makes that easier. And the second thing is that this I, this proposal of kind of execution hap like the proposal of having execution happen on the beacon chain like if that's what's done then like the way that the system would be used is basically that, that like shard chains would gener would like, generally be a roll up um, and like this is kind of pushing in a similar direction I think. So on that part, you had a, a slot on the shard. Mm -hmm. The slot on the beacon chain was, was the slot on the shard chain was skipped. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, slot yes. three and four? Yes. So the, the state is still on the shard chain. Um, correct. Yeah. In this, yes, the state right here is on the shard chain. So how could you <coughs> how could you move state between shards? Um, in this particular case, the move would be delayed. Yeah, but in, in any other case, how well, do you in any other you case, so like basically, like every execution environment is going to be, or every one of these blocks is going to be aware of the post state, all the post state routes over here. And if, so you, you could just the so you have mechanisms that yeah. remove tokens, consume tokens. You could have mechanisms like you could you could have an EE that just like swaps. Yeah, yeah. Like basically, to someone else on that swap. Right. So the like in general, the thing that EE execution is aware of is it'll be aware of the like it's always aware of the previous statement of its own shard, and it's also aware of recent statements of other shards. But like that, you know, like the way that you use that abstraction can be in like, lots of things. Like you could, like yeah, and I'd say like basically the fact that this proposal is kind of biasing toward more layer one communication, like basically it does kind of push it more toward this uh, kind of idea of like shards as being things that you just do computation in. Isn't the only reason you want to keep the state of the shard just to have the, the missing synchronization as an option? That's um, the only real reason to keep it there. Oh, you mean over here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. So if, right. if you want that feature, then you need to keep the state on the shard. Otherwise. Correct. Well, you need to keep, like, well, every shard block is, like, is going to point to this previous block, so, yeah. So I think what Keith was asking whether we could, uh, uh -huh. we could really just move all the state from the shards. Oh, remove all, yes. Okay, so in, one question. In this proposal. Right, so mm -hmm. in this proposal, I guess one question is, like, why not simplify it even more radically and just say, like, if this thing does not get included, then this thing is just screwed. <laughs> Right? And if you do that, then like you really are removing state from shards completely because like all the state, like the only state that exists is state that gets passed through the beacon chain. Do you give a lot of power to the HP composer? Yes, basically. Okay. Way too much power. Because I can I can just say, I don't like that block, I'm not gonna include it. And now that block is, can never be foregoing some sort of profit, obviously, for inclusion of it. Yeah. I mean if we want to kind of make things slightly better, we could say something like, oh, we have a period of two slots within which to include these things, and that would turn the power into a one of two, but like, I hear Dan yeah, Justin nodding his head, or you know, like nodding in the horizontal, like in that direction. <laughs> so, yes. So when, sorry, so, I don't know if this is kind of what we said, but 
In this new model, if you DOS the block proposer, mm -hmm. right, this is one of the yes. one of the difficulties, all the shards halt. Um, shards continue, what? but cross shard communication. But cross shard communications will halt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. What um, I guess what are thoughts around that? This uh, is one of this is one of the reasons Justin is excited about secret leader election. In, <laughs> I mean, also like in the long term, all the optimistic stuff that we might be avoiding in the short term, I think will still be valuable at some point. <laughs> Uh, secret leader election protocols like are not too scary. Like, like especially if we do one with the uh, based on ring signatures, then <laughs> yeah. the annoying thing is the Tor integration. So basically, it's like a two-step process. In the first step, you have this kind of um, pre-registration where you send a message, um, which is which is secretly uh, you know, attached to your identity, but people don't really know it's attached to your identity yet. Uh, and this has to be done over Tor so that you don't do linking at the network level. And then when you produce the block, then you re you reveal your identity. So I guess like it's not useful to do secret leader election until we have like the Tor backing. Right. Right. Okay. And that's that's good rationale for delaying it until phase two or three. <laughs> what do you mean by cross shard communication with the fault? Um, basically, so let's assume that all block proposers become bad for a while. Then you have like shard blocks, um, and then nothing would be included. So then you'd have a bunch of other shard blocks, and they would be kind of aware of each other in this direction. But then like you would have no cross communication until eventually uh, things come back. So let's assume some of them work, some of them don't. Mm -hmm. If we just include in each of the shard block a list of shards which were touched, then we could we could so, still do communication on those. Yeah, yeah, you're, gonna yeah you're right. Like, if anything that touches the chain. Like if no, like if we well, I think what he might be saying is that like you could also have communication graphs that are kind of partially intertwined. So like for example, like you could no, require no this charts, you could require this block to have an opinion on like these two and you could have them look yeah. like um in a kind of, like in a dependent dependent way. I guess the problem there is that then like when you have things actually have to come together, like you would have to kind of first include these and then based on that include these and based on that include these. So the algorithm for catching up would be more complex, maybe. Um, so my understanding is that so for the uh, sharp block, there yeah, might be cross a one become block. Mm -hmm. It is possibly to execute all the transactions. Right? If um, a shard block gets included in the beacon block, it's possible. No, no, I mean the sharp block includes the, the next here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so in that case, is there any talk about for example incentive to include such kind? Someone you can always so how do you actually say, resolve? Hey, I, I just observe critics. I don't want to include the biggest one. Yeah. How do you, how do you resolve the cross shard transactions in the next block? Are they forcibly done, or do you have the option? So in the proposal that I have, the kind of the total the total Etherneting is forcibly done, but the receipts you have to kind of do yourself, and they're an execution level thing. Um, how can we sure each it, it must be executed successfully? Um, so basically, like. So the approach in my proposal is that you basically require each shard block here. So like if this is say shard index one, then over here like each of these shard blocks is going to publish a Merkle tree that just says like this is how much ETH we're sending to each other shard. And so this shard is going to have to include the Merkle branch from here. It'll have to include the Merkle branch from here. It'll have to include that same Merkle branch from here. Look, like, this is one proposal. I mean, you could also kind of make it more forgiving. And then the following question is like how to, um, for example, if in that so so post in the latest case, there are multiple blocks that are not being included by Bitcoin, Bitcoin block, and later it be recruited with multiple uh, shard blocks. Yeah. And so that means there was a significant burden that uh, following shard block to include all these mm -hmm. uh, transactions, cross shard transactions, or cross shard messages. Yeah. If it's possible. So well, it's not, no, it's not going to be forced. But even on the ETH ones, there'd still be a load induced if right. you let them pack up. Yeah, so if there's a limit to how much you can catch up with that one block. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one shot transaction, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Can, uh, 
do you have some assumptions or expectations on how what percentage of transactions will be cross chain and how that affects the size of the beacon chain box? So in this well, okay, so in this like I'm generally assuming that a, a large portion of transactions will be cross chain. Um, so okay, the beacon chain is not required to like literally include like all of one data for every single cross chain transaction, right? Like most of it happens through receipt passing, like. Basically, the only thing here that you need is you need like shard chains to be aware of of uh, routes from other from all these other shard chains. You can do things with receipts, and if he wants to move ETH cross shard, then you need to have like some kind of ETH, basic ETH netting capability between like different execution targets on different shards. So um, we're here today to talk about ETH state execution in general, and this is highly relevant, uh, just because this uh, reconfiguring of the architecture um, has to kind of changes how we might be thinking about uh, pressure communication, state execution, things like that, and actually how it ripples out the developer. Um, but there were a number of other questions that y'all had before. Um, Can I have another question? Yeah, please. Yes, <laughs> you can always have more questions. Uh, so in, in this proposal, basically, the fee payments seem to be much more simpler, so maybe the fee markets are going to be way more simpler. But we still have the question on how do actually end users going to propose their transactions yes. and state providers. Um, maybe you want to talk a tiny bit on that. Sure. Um, but state uh, providers. Yes. Oh, really? <laughs> state providers would still need to keep an eye on all 64 charts. So I guess if I'm a user, then <clears throat> one thing you could do is you could say, oh. <clears throat> I'm gonna. I have like full state on this store, and I can just like self package. Another thing you could do is you could just like talk to a full like. You basically use like the like client protocols, right? So like I, I see Joel two spots behind you. <laughs> yeah. No, you use like client protocol like like client protocols, right? So basically, like you talk to if you don't have full state in some shard for some execution environment, then you would just talk to a server that does, the server gives you branches, and then you kind of package and broadcast. Right, so it simple, greatly simplifies the fee market, but there's still a notion of state providers, relayers, I don't know that term, yeah. I feel like applies to all sorts of things, but there's still an idea of like other providers outside of just the immediate consensus. Like weird gener general purpose hash pre-image providers. Yeah, yeah, market participants, free market participants. Yeah, free market hash rate. So one concern with this we had was in the previous one it was even a bigger concern because you had a pass in twenty four charts and the state provider would have to have an eye on each of those. Uh, but it, it's much lower number now. Um, and I think the reason we like the the, the pre intra proposal <laughs> Right. Um, was that you could maybe have some kind of scheduling, figuring out which shards given execution environments would be on. So the state provider could just restrict the view. Yeah, I mean, here you can also have like execution environments that are restricted to a few shards. Yeah, so uh, I have this basically, like during this conference, I kind of come to the conclusion that basically the, um, it's kind of funny that, like, I think that E2 maybe. Like the, the uh, issue of just like in general aggregating transactions or aggregating state isn't something that the E2 specification actually addresses, right? So it's more about like I feel like if, if initially at least like I mean if, if E2 is mostly about uh, achieving consensus, mm -hmm. then um, and just you know like making uh, state and execution is kind of abstract thing, then it's. It's sort of funny because like in ETH1, all we've ever been doing is like we've al always just been worrying about like state and execution. Like I mean the consensus portion of ETH1 is that like never breaks. <laughs> so like I mean all that ever breaks in ETH1 is you know like state and execution. So I feel like there's <clears throat> something where... Um, yeah. um, I mean this is all, there's definitely kind of bad and good aspects to this. Like one good aspect is that it basically means that like if we want, we can just like bring ETH1 state and execution kind of rules almost as they are inside of this. Um, I mean, add some cross shard stuff, but yeah. and another I mean, a bad thing obviously is that this means that kind of work is being done to kind of allow lots of different kinds of things to work, but kind of less work is being done to create one specific very good thing that works. But like that's that's paralyzable. It just means that. We need more team, more teams dedicated to creating a very specific 
thing that um, thing that works. And one benefit is that it means that like, if we if we do have a kind of good solid consensus layer that provides kind of enough base functionality that people want, then like you can keep you know, we can keep working on those other things. So I do feel like we actually already have like a couple of things working on like the one. The, the, like the one good thing, and that's like ETH one. Right. So, yeah. Like it is. Kind of like, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think like making ETH one like be a popular like ETH making ETH one plus like simple cross shard receipt passing like be a popular execution environment at the beginning is totally fine. Yeah. It, it seems to be kind of fairly kind of network effect preserving. And I had a I had a conversation with some members of your team and you know suggesting Geth the context of ETH1 as an EE is like still like a crucial portion or some version or iteration of is a crucial portion of the software stack. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it, it is that that like view into the state, that view into syncing it. Like, well, there's a lot of, there's, there are basically a lot of things in like ETH1 clients that are like out, out of, outside of any specification. Like one thing that, I mean, there's obviously like there's transaction handling, right? They handling these things. There's actually no need to specify these things because there's always better ways to like do them in any kind of software and this is just like a software problem. You can just like, keep improving it and stuff. And I feel it's really beautiful that 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 E2 took the step and actually like sort of said like, you know, this is not our problem with the with the introduction of EEs. Yeah. It's just it just means that like, like it's someone else's it's problem. It's still someone's problem. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> we do actually have like a pretty good idea of like what that problem is because all we've ever been doing is like we've been living inside this one specific EE that is right now. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like we already know like what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yes. Is that mean the new model is based on the block and slot and uh, is the iPod still being using in this new model? E block yeah. is being used for FFG. Yeah, so you still divide slots into epochs. All validators are called upon to do to attest once per that unit of epoch. Um, to both crosslink, but also to vote on the FFG. So the cycle of FFG is still like large units of slots, uh, rather than on a, on a per slot. The only thing it does is essentially it takes that shuffling of committees, and rather than having a set of shards, a set of shards, a set of shards, a different set of shards per slot, it's just the same shards each slot. Um, but the rest of the mechanics are, are highly uh, similar. And so actually, I'm in an exercise right now, essentially just like removing the notion of a crosslink from phase zero, um, so that because phase zero in terms of fork choice, in terms of the valid what the validator is doing, and in terms of like voting on is all very much the same. Cool, we have slide of questions. Oh yeah. Why limit communication between EEs to async when not let an E call another E synchronously? Um, my main answer to this would be that like then you would have to deal with like E and E level reentrancy stuff, which just seems like weird and complicated. But like if people want, we could do it. I guess the like the post state of an EU execution would then be like two state routes. It, it, it would. Well, I guess the idea would be that like right now, like if EEs can't call each other, it's more like you have like A, then B, then C. But then here you would have like A, and then you might have B, and then B just decides that oh we're gonna call A inside of here, and A decides oh we're gonna call B inside of here. Um, and then B ends, and then A ends, and then B ends again, and then you have like C, and then B over here. Um, like, there is benefits, but like you can see how this is a potentially a security nightmare. Even if we don't have that synchronous, could we maybe in the same shard block mm -hmm. if the yeah. so ones are the same block? Right. Yeah. Do the one first and then refer to it in the yeah. second. So one thing we can do is we, I think we can kind of allow kind of data free, like basically free receipt passing between um, ex from one execution to some separate ones. I think that's a really good idea. If you don't do that, then you can parallelize. So there's actually one very good reason to allow receipt passing between kind of separate executions of an EE, which is basically that like, if one updates the Merkle tree, then the other might have witnesses that are old and you might have to update them. So, yeah, and it's generally kind of, and it's definitely good for sanity and parallelized as well. Parallelization, yeah. Yeah, and execution as well. Can you explain the parallel? Oh, well, if you had 
So this is like if you have no ability to kind of communicate between different EEs, then you Which could just like say, a single block. yeah, then you could just say like one thread runs all the A, one thread runs all the B, one thread runs all the C, and then you add at the end. Which kind of nice. Yeah, like mm -hmm. that might even be good because that way we would um, is it be able to like, get blocks produced and verified more quickly. But then you can't store your assets in a different EE. Like you can't have like token EEs. That's true. This is true. Which means all the EEs have to own their own tokens. Right, this is true. Yeah. So maybe all the more communication is good. You can fully find it. You can use find it. Should EEs be open for any <laughs> We talked about. Should EEs be open for anyone to deploy or restrict it? Huh? You go from the top. Oh, oh, they're they're up, but I, I didn't know. Uh, just Talks on no phase two and just using phase one. Um, huh. So we thought about this. Um, I guess. I mean, the main re like one of the big reasons phase two was nice is that we have a built-in fee market. I mean, we could do like phase one plus minimal fee market. But if we do that, then like a minimal fee market requires ETH, and people will require ETH to be owned by smart contracts, and so yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, there's two. Does this mean that you know, the ETH, the current ETH chain keeps running in parallel forever? No, it would just mean the ETH chain becomes a roll of contracts and it goes to the chain. Are you still executed? No. Yeah. Yeah. You still need to execute it, and I'll, like. Even if you have a roll-up chain, right? Proposers need to execute it because proposers need to know like what the hell am I supposed to include and what's actually going to give me fees. But like, if you if we kind of go roll-up style, then cross-link committees would would theoretically not need to vote on like, execution results, which could be interesting. Like, you could have a setup where <coughs> voting on execution results is kind of delayed a bit, and this could be well. No, that's not good because that hurts like for us, sure. Why do we even need shards? If we can achieve the same amount of data availability throughput in a non sharded system with erasure coded data availability proofs? I guess because that kind of centralizes proposing. Say you have no execution on shards, then yeah. and no shards. <laughs> then you don't need. To, then you don't need shards. Yeah, I mean, this is well. I guess. I mean, like when when you look at like the, the the kind of the data availability chain proposals, like there's been a couple of them recently, right? Like there, I mean, it's an interesting idea. Like you just go like full minimalism on the shards, and then you just like have you just say the whole thing is supposed to be a roll up, um, but then basically allow like the proposals that I've seen like they do kind of allow different people to submit like different uh, block routes in parallel and like that is shopping right mm -hmm. like any system that I like I think any system that doesn't kind of bottleneck proposing so that one person needs to be aware of everything is kind of sharding by definition There's definitely a trade-off between like how much you abstract versus the market complexity, and that's one of the big things we've learned over the last six months. Do you envision that EEs need to be um, the execution of them, like uh, actually happens on like the shard client itself, or would, you, would we need some all external client to be uh, maintaining this? So like running the code would be done by shard clients because you have to like check the state routes. Um, doing kind of user-specific activity like maintaining state and like generating witnesses and like all of that is definitely kind of good like terrain that that like things like GAF would need to would need to continue to exist for. Challenges in relayer markets and challenges with new markets. Um, <sighs> I mean, people here have complained to me about challenges over your layer markets. <laughs> the, I, I, I think 
the main challenge with the relayer markets is basically that like, and this this is like a common opinion I like. So an opinion I had like two to three months ago is that like it's good that we have like optimistic rollup and the zk rollup happening on each one because like that means that there's more people like deep thinking and experimenting about relayer markets, and that community seems to be kind of coming to the conclusion that rollup chains are likely to have monopoly proposers. Um, and the argument basically is that like as soon as there's one party that's better at sequencing than others, then like, they need to be only slightly better and they can outbid everyone else. Uh, and this potentially has censorship risks. And so like that makes it on a layer two in a layer two context, you can obviously switch to different systems, but in a layer one context, like you can't. Um, and so yeah, in a layer one context, like you want more security than that can provide. So the next one we kind of talked about this morning and is contentious among some of the participants of uh, designers of these systems. Should EEs be open for anyone to deploy or restrict it? And I'll give you a quick on the um, the range there. The, on the one end, um, you could deploy the system uh, such that EEs can be deployed by anyone with a certain economic model to deploy these, probably very expensive to do so. Um, let people play with them, let standards emerge, and just kind of see what happens. Um, on the other extreme, there are some participants that argue that maybe we should deploy one EE, a very good EE that, that feels like Ethereum and kind of gives a very clear user story um, and allows people to like build up and, and begin operating in this sharded context and then eventually open up EEs to the, the deploy and, and let it, people experiment. Um, the second proposal was called dictatorial this morning. <laughs> but at the same time provides like a little bit more guarantee that we get something that looks and feels like Ethereum. Uh, so it's a, it's a, to be debated still. Um, the second proposal does allow EEs still, because you can build EEs on top of this nice base layer. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah. So I guess the question is what it means to have a deployed top level EE versus deploying little, what do you call them, EEs or child contracts as children under them. The yeah, first thing probably, uh, So probably that would be one, one or two big EEs that uh, some big teams are going to develop and uh, so what would be the benefits of not letting anyone experiment with some other stuff in the meantime? So one kind of distinction has to do with like state. So one of the remaining rules of an EE is kind of like describing kind of user level state structure. Um, and if we have one enshrined EE and then let people build EEs in, the, in that EE, then like no matter how successful the subsequent EEs are, they're because they depend on the original EE. Like whatever the state model of the original EE is, that's like a state model, like that state is state that, that basically everyone will need to have. Um, whereas if EEs are more parallel with each other, then like, if one EE falls into this use, then kind of fewer people can store its state, um, and fewer, and, and so fewer people like uh, like it might become like so slightly more difficult to do things with it. But like other people don't need to be bothered with that data, and and so a kind of a parallel approach, like at least in the short term, it gives us freedom not to commit to a particular state structure and to a particular trade-off between thing, involving things like rent versus like, storage size versus like, cost of, uh, of filling a uh, first persistent state. There's also risks in how these EEs are interpreted and used, and also with respect to uh, potential bugs. Someone brought up this morning, like, the only, from a layer one perspective, the only thing that owns EEs are like validators and EEs, and then you actually, as a user, own EEs within the context of the account structure within that EE. Uh, but if, for example, there was a very popular EE that exchange is recognized um, and someone exploited a bug such that the account structure within the EE thought that it had a bunch more ETH, even though layer one still thought that it only had 10 ETH in that EE, someone's account now that the exchange recognizes as a valid account might have more ETH. So this is kind of like akin to a bug where wrapped ETH might print wrapped ETH, but there's actually not that much ETH backing it. Um, so there's there's like all sorts of complexities on like how this concept and domain is just rolled out to users, rolled out to exchanges, rolled out to like the various participants and the various all sorts of other accompanying software that need to go with interfacing. So that's 
So there's just a lot of complexities and a lot of conversation we still have around what these things mean. So Same what if, if one of the E's has consensus <coughs> issues, mm -hmm. then it might stop the, uh, the network from working because you cannot get enough signatures, right? Because if they are for one PE, there's two implementations. Um, yeah, the E is would be written in issues. one. The E is would be written in one assembly. Right. So there's a like there is no notion of a consensus error on E. It's just the code that runs. Um, oh, okay. okay. So the engine is kind of in hard coding. Yeah, it gets deployed to the vcontain. It's a code. It's code. There's a question back there. There's all sorts of questions. Yeah. So comment. So I understand the risk that if anybody can deploy E, some may fall into misuse, and then you have bloat to the state uh, on the vcontain. There was a proposal that maybe uh, you lock up E to to deploy it. Yes. And you you may need to over time you may need to lock up more, kind of like a rent. But if you actually burn that heat, then it's going to stay there forever. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that would be something worth exploring. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I really see that the risk, one of the risks you guys really bring up is that it's bloat and big engine. Like allowing many E's? Um, which may fell into misuse. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, that, possible. That, and that probably is the biggest lockup model is like, reasonable. As long as other participants yeah. can pitch in to lock up and that there's like plenty of time because you wouldn't want yeah. a very popular E to just... Is it the other reason you brought up is that there might be a bug in your rep practically, it's true. but that, that already exists on Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are risks, like an exchange uh, having rap teeth as, as good, looking as good as ETH in their exchange and there's, they're taking on risks by doing that. I mean, if exchanges are going to create a separate token for beacon ETH in phase 0 and phase 1, then we should expect, you know, E1, E2, E3, E3, E3. That would be kind of terrible. Well, that would be such a bad company. Uh, especially given that, that in this proposal, they, the different E's are like, synchronously convertible to each other. Yes. Yes, but then if there's a bug in one of the E's, then how bad? Well, and not until its balance gets drained, like, you know. Great. So maybe tokens should just be held by very few, very simple EEs, and we should have simple results. Mm. Greg? Uh, are there bounds that, like, I'm sorry, I just am not too familiar with it, so. Speak up. Hey, yeah, so are there bounds on EEs, like, so assuming we could deploy our own, um, is it deterministic on, like, execution time of the EEs? Like, is there a bound? Or are there, there is, there are, what, we're assuming, like, a system level, yes. Okay, so that, that's how right. you determine So that. you could deploy an EE that, like, say, just burns through computation, but yeah. no, one, no one would be able to make a block on it if, if it always capped on the gas line. Cool, okay, that makes sense. So this issue with, like, poten like EEs potentially accumulating on the beacon chain sounds like you might just want to go to the next level and add, like, Status beacon chain where like the EE comes <laughs> with. We like, need the system level participants to be able to uh, compute. Well, I know, but it's more about like I mean, we already kind of like like we've seen that problem happen before, you know, with the state where like I, just, like, right. I feel like that can, there's a good make, opportunity now to like avoid. Yeah, you can make the, the like the idea is you gen you want these to be very expensive and you want them yeah, to be yeah, yeah, yeah. so so blocking up bounds state size, if there's like a, a certain amount of block for the size of the EE, or and burning also bounds. So like, we, we don't explore those rather than, yeah. even if it was an expensive, but just a fee model, that would yeah, not be the same. Yeah, just like, focus on like EE rent or something. Yeah, this is, right. we essentially have to have some. Yeah. Because yeah. the vegan chain it has to be synced by, when you're pretty much anyone that's fully syncing in the shard chains, they have to sync this component, so we got to back. Yeah, and like if we set it so you have to like lock or burn an ether per kilobyte and people decide to burn 30, 30 million ETH to create, to blow the state by 30 gigabytes, then like the ETH maximalist lobby is going to be really happy. <laughs> <laughs> A uh, question about the resharding. How often do we need to reshard one data set? And how many data we are seeing? Uh, uh, so here, like these are just cross link committees, so they adjust every block. Okay. Mm. Um, well, 
Chile's have their own gas equivalent. That's actually more, that's a layer one concept. It's yeah. like the gas against, uh, well, it's Mexican chain and gas limits in the market. Uh, EIP 1599, yeah. Uh, when launch? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we're going to third. <laughs> 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 we get these, get these zero kind of like, solid. We have all sorts of stuff moving in parallel, yeah. and it's, it's, it's moving as fast as possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we have 64 shards. Yeah. <laughs> the, ultimately, this proposal, uh, we believe, is, is a simplifying proposal, um, and one that will allow us to get things out faster than previously. Similarly with the EEs, mm -hmm. it's a simplifying proposal, so things are moving, and that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I mean, like, in terms of, like, in the, the other reason, like, I am, I like this as simplification gains, so like basically a, a lot of kind of shard chain logic that we've been kind of wrangling with becomes less needed. Um, also, like a lot of proof of, like proof of custody complexity can be kind of reduced down further because, well, basically you would be able to reduce everything to a single kind of fraud proof, or the single fraud proof as it just is importing an entire shard block into the beacon chain. And that's something that was not possible with crosslinks because a crosslink is just too big to import into the beacon chain. Um, the last one in the answer, how about, uh, this will be the last one, what will the transaction throughput be per shard? Yeah, so, um, I mean, by these numbers, I estimated like 1.3 into 2.7 megabytes per second of data. So if we allow like computation, like, if we assume one transaction is uh, uh, as being like 100 bytes, then that's well, 1.3 million divided by 100 will see the 13,000. But, like... It depends on the construction. Yeah, it depends on the constructions. It depends on whether or not you're using a roll-up. It depends on, like, what the gas statement is. It depends on if people write 50 these. Are they allowed to write these? In no version of the proposal is do we not open up these. Um, I also... I, I just, I just want to speak to the two ranges of it, I, I don't firmly sit in one camp. So don't look at me like that. <laughs> yeah, no, to, make, to make it easy, you need to have a key from a multi-sig, and he's going to hold one of the keys. It's a one of one multi-sig. <laughs> yeah. I, I would assume in a single EE per shard, yep. oh. yeah, there could be multiple EEs per one shard. Yes. Yeah, so when you make a block, you'd probably specify what EE it's for, or what set of EEs, and then that would interpret the block data as such against the uh, what about the cross-EE communication? You can do this. Yeah, it would likely be asynchronous on the order of a block in this, a slot in this proposal, but there's there's definitely room to discuss intra-EE within one shard communication in a block. Okay. Last question. Um, the tying in with that, what are the consequences of constant times in that case? If, I mean, like, just depending on how many validators select a specific type of EE. No, validators don't select, uh, oh, proposers right. will select. Right, yeah. Um, like, so, so yeah, I'm thinking so it's like we're running two EEs upon one rise. How does that affect the transfer times uh, between so just, and inside? Yeah, so I mean, if you're, it's, it's, a, it's a free market. So in, in general, like, if, say, one block can have one EE, if there are very high value EEs with lots of uh, with, with lots of high value transactions, those would be picked up more than, say, an underutilized EE might only have demand to be processed every handful of blocks. So, but that the actual mechanics are there. But wouldn't that just mean it monopolized completely? Yeah. Um, not necessarily, and the that was an extreme case where we just have one EE per, but if you allow multiple EEs per, then yeah. likely like you might fill in the gaps at the end with like uh, underutilized. But, but actual last question. But is it, I mean, is it theoretical? Like, could we say that if, uh, the question was if it's time, so it's proportional to the amount of validators that are willing to execute that E question? It's not, well, everyone, so it, a proposer, similar to a proposer in ETH1, uh, gets to kind of bundle things in as they see economically fit. Um, it's not a matter of like all the other validators coming in and voting on. 
So, but again, if you're in a very underutilized EE, you might have to pay some very high, you might have to pay a, a oh, higher fee to, to, to convince somebody to include stuff. Um, some of us were hoping that in the previous proposals, EEs would have some kind of cash to save on local crews. I was just wondering how um, this new proposal would affect the state could be moved between the shorts. Um, yeah, I mean, this proposal definitely kind of, uh, it reduces the amount of kind of cross-block saving that you can do, but like, you get some of the benefits back because like the, block, the individual blocks get bigger. Um, so, but the, in terms of like having it the cash, generally we usually think of EEs as having like a state route through two bytes per shard, uh, but we've we've discussed at the, op the option opportunity of like, when deploying an EE, depending on the amount of capital block burned, like you could specify, you know, a state root per shard, or maybe like some larger chunk of data, which would end up being like a, a, a cache. Um, so that's still kind of up to debate the actual mechanics and, and economics around how these things are deployed. But it, it's something we're definitely looking into. Um, I think we're going to call it because uh, I think we're over time, and that was great. Thanks, everyone.